New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. You can now download a free PDF copy or purchase a beautiful printed edition of Issue 5 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring psychotherapy, porous mind, and spirit possession. My guest is Robert Falconer, who is an experienced psychotherapist working with internal family systems therapy. He considers himself a spiritual guide. Richard Schwartz, the founder of Internal Family Systems, has written, I don't know of anyone else who has been to more of my workshops as a participant or assistant or has done more work on him or herself. Robert is co-author with Richard Schwartz of Many Minds, One Self, Evidence for a Radical Shift in Paradigm. He is author of Other Worlds Within Us, Internal Family Systems, Porous Mind, and Spirit Possession. He is also author of the forthcoming book, When You're Going Through Hell, Keep Going, Trauma, Healing, Spirit, and internal family systems. Robert is based in Santa Cruz, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Robert. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm delighted to be with you, Jeff. I have to tell you, as I did before, I want to repeat this so our audience gets it. I think your work takes all of the previous work that I'm aware of integrating uh, what we might call uh, spirit depossession and psychotherapy, takes it to a new level. It's an extremely significant book. I'm so glad that I encountered it because the issues that you deal with are the sorts of issues people report to me on a regular basis. And I think your work in this area is very deep, profound, and advanced. And I want to make sure that our viewers understand how significant, I think, what you're doing is. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I don't know how much our viewers know about you. Maybe you could talk about your background. And uh, and I know before you began to do work in internal family systems therapy, you were exposed to a wide variety of other therapeutic modalities. You live uh, right next to the Esalen Institute, and, and you were exposed to uh, Gestalt therapy to start out with. Well, let me go back further. And I could talk about this stuff as much or as little as your viewers could stand. But I come from an extremely wildly abusive family. Physical, sexual violence, suicide, murder, really bad. And I could discuss that a lot. So I was motivated by a personal need to find healing. And it, for much of my life, it was well, you really should kill yourself. You're such a mess. And I'd make this list of, well, if you're going to do that, you ought to do this, 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 and this first. And I kept adding stuff on the bottom of the list as I went along. And I'm stubborn. I'm as stubborn as a mule, which is a, a life-saving quality for me. And I just kept going to every therapy modality I could find that might help. And a lot of them actually were quite damaging which is really sad, but true. And I found a whole bunch that were helpful, and I've sort of stepped up this ladder, and I could talk at great length about any of them. The work of Milton Erickson, who I think was a shaman disguised as a psychiatrist, and I studied that a lot. And then ego state therapy with Jack and Helen Watkins grew out of that, which was about meeting the parts of us, which they called ego states, and 
improving the relationships. And then, like you mentioned, Esalen and the Gestalt tradition, which, uh, again, it's parts work. You know, you talk to your parts and interact with them. Uh, Pia Melody's work, she, she calls it post-induction therapy. And there are all these other psychosynthesis, voice dialogue, they're all these parts work modalities. And finally, after going through all these different ones, I ended up with uh, internal family systems. And I'm, I believe it's the most potent and the most respectful of all these models. And I actually believe it is potent because it's respectful. The kindness and respect that internal family systems has for all the different parts of us uh, really makes it a lot stronger. We don't tend to equate respectfulness with power, and I think that's a big mistake. I know you've been influenced by Carl Rogers and his client-centered therapy. It's very respectful therapy. I've also been influenced by Carl Rogers coming out of the University of Wisconsin, where he had quite a bit of influence and was located at one time. But so it's not just respect. You're doing much more than Carl Rogers did. Well, I'll go into a little bit of the history. Dick Richard Schwartz is the founder of Internal Family Systems, 40-something years ago, more or less. And he was a family systems therapist. And they didn't study the inside of a person's mind at all. They thought if they just rearranged the family, it would cure everybody. And he had a bunch of families with uh, children with eating disorders, usually bulimia or anorexia. And he rearranged the family the way you're supposed to. And he'd already at a young age published the major textbook in the field. And um, his clients didn't get better. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of fudging the data, like most people do these days, it seems, he actually got really curious about what's going on. And his clients started talking about parts of themselves, like there's a part of me who wants to eat, and then another part w wants to make me vomit, and this part hates this part. And then he got this idea, oh, I could apply all the systems thinking and tools of family therapy inside each person. Because we are, we're, we're a family. We're much more like, if you're a sports fan, we're much more like a basketball team than a tennis player. And this, this is another major thing I think is super important. Before uh, IFS, almost all the systems saw dissociation as a product of trauma and a kind of pathology. And I think it's really, really clear now that it's not. It's a healthy part of how we function as humans and how our minds are structured. It's part of the architecture of mind. You point out, of course, that the idea that the mind has parts goes Back to some of the earliest work in psychotherapy, Freud is classically known to talk about the id, the ego, and the superego. And I think from there, it just sort of flourished. And Jung, with his idea of complexes, that's a Jung's idea of complexes is much closer to IFS's idea of parts than, than Freud's. I want to, it goes way back, way further than that. Plato had a multiple model of mind. And in one of the dialogues, Socrates is talking to somebody else, I forget, and they say, well, the very fact that we can debate something within our heads, we can have a part of us who wants to do this and another part says no, that shows we're multiple. And they just sort of go on, well, yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> you know? So that was like a background to their thinking. And it's also in, in Taoism. They they have the 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 shen and the po, you know, the ten parts classically of the soul. It's a really really ancient idea that continually gets squashed. I think especially in the West because it's it's another step in dethroning our egos. <laughs> you know, we're we're not even in control of this uh, our own brains really, and that's kind of hard for a lot of people to accept. 
Let me talk a little bit more about your specific background. I notice on your webpage, you refer to yourself not as a psychotherapist, but as a spiritual advisor. And, and I also see uh, you mentioned you have a master's degree, and I think you worked with Eric Erickson's daughter, and uh, I gather that was hypnosis work. Mil Milton Erickson's daughter. That there, everybody gets them confused. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I've come to believe, and nobody heals from major trauma without a spiritual connection, and. It doesn't seem to matter very much. Well, I guess it matters, but it's, it doesn't matter what flavor, what belief system, that stuff doesn't matter. But they have to have some ground of being. You know, Viktor Frankl talked about it as they have to be able to find meaning. And he said, you know, in the concentration camps, the people who couldn't find a way to make meaning out of their existence died. And we tend to think of spirituality as this icing we put on the cake later. No, it's what determines who lives and who dies. So I think, I think we tend to have that absolutely backwards. And IFS, this is Bob talking. This is not the voice of IFS. <laughs> in, in your recent book, Robert Schwartz wrote an introduction in, in which he said he's almost a little bit embarrassed to have you come out so publicly uh, dealing in, in the area of uh, spirit depossession or spirit possession uh, because it it implies a paradigm which is generally rejected by the psychiatric and the psychological professions. The, the idea that, to, I guess the most basic way of putting it is that consciousness is primary, not matter, not the brain. Yep, exactly. You wouldn't, well, you probably would believe, because I'm sure you've taken a lot of flack over the years for espousing the ideas you do. But I've gotten a lot of resistance and for a while was pretty much exiled from the IFS community because I wouldn't stop talking about this. And um, I think it's really important. There are suffering people out there. Sometimes just the knowledge that something foreign to your mind can get into your mind and influence you can be immensely healing for, for a person. I'd, I'd like to do. Is it okay if I tell a little story about that? Absolutely. Okay. This woman came to me after, after, after the event. She had been at an ayahuasca ceremony in California, and it was very poorly managed, and she felt it was bad and wrong, and she left, and she had this, she really felt horrible. Driving back to her apartment here in California, she had a florid psychotic episode and was confined to an institution. Her parents, no previous history of psychosis. Parents come out, drive her back from California to the Midwest. In that two-day drive, they had to stop several times and have her institutionalized and sedated because she would try and jump out of the car on the freeway. Intermittent, extreme, florid, psychotic episodes. They get her home. This keeps continuing. And she had a, I think it was cousin, who was psychic. And the cousin came and said to her, this is not part of you. Just tell this thing. I have nothing here for you but love when it comes back. Do that as a mantra. I have nothing here for you but love. I have nothing here for you but love. And she did it, and it worked. <laughs> when, when she started having this psychotic episode again, she did that as a mantra, and it stopped. And she came to me later, you know, just, what happened? What was that? And, like, sort of clean up afterwards. And I said to her, well, sometimes these dark energies seem to be allergic to love. And then she thought about this for quite a while, and then she said to me, you know, I think it's just recognizing that there could be something that's not part of my, part of me inside my mind was really what was healing. Just that much can heal people. So I wouldn't shut up. <laughs> 
it brings up for me a, a bit of a paradox, and, and the paradox is based on the I, idea that we get from all the great mystics throughout history that at our deepest level, we are one with everything. So ultimately, there is nothing that isn't a part of us. And yet, at the same time, of course, we, we are, as Alan Watts said, skin-encapsulated egos. I, I can say that you and I are the same, but it, we're also very different. So it seems that being human itself is paradoxical. I would agree. You know, William James had one of the images I really like for this. I'm a big fan of William James, and it's unfortunate he's largely unread. <laughs> um, he said, we're, we individual humans are like islands in an ocean. We look very separate, but we're all the same seafloor. And I, I think it's something like that. And, you know, Bernardo Castrop talks about these dissociative barriers, which, which give us the experience of being separate. But I think the key thing about these dissociative barriers is they're permeable. They're never absolute. And we in the West have somehow, probably in about the time of the Reformation, adopted this idea that our minds are private isolated and our property. And Tanya Luhrmann, the great anthropologist, calls this the citadel model of mind. And it looks all powerful and strong, but it's really, really brittle and really, really fragile. And I think it's a misconception that is at the root of many of the worst things, the hugest problems in modern civilization. Well, I gather that Richard Schwartz, in, in his work, Internal Family Systems Therapy, is, is basically saying that we each have a, a family within our, within our psyches. And uh, so that work ha has a lot to do with getting the different members of the family, the internal family, to get along with each other. The metaphor I like to use is most people are walking around in a state of internal civil war. And most human energy, very sadly, goes into these internal civil wars of people hating themselves. Like somebody going, I want that ice cream, and another part going, you idiot, you're already overweight. <laughs> and You know, wham, 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 all the time. I think most human energy goes there. Mm. And so the... the the image for me is helping people transform their inner experience from an internal civil war to an orchestra or a jazz band or whatever their favorite kind of music is, choir. And, you know, in an orchestra, you don't want the, everybody to be playing the tuba. <laughs> you need all the different instruments. It's not like putting everybody in a blender and fusing them at all. But it... At some point, you decided to take it a step further, and I gather Richard Schwartz used the term unattached burdens to to refer to these, uh, uh, which were at that time, I guess, thought of as rare experiences uh, people had of some part of their psyche, but it wasn't part of their psyche. It was, wasn't part of them at all. It was unattached. Yep. Yep. And I'd heard of these things because I, I really loved uh, the IFS model and it had helped me with my healing from my big trauma background immensely. And I was teaching it. And I'll tell you the story of how I got involved in this. In, in being on the staff of these trainings, one of my jobs was to sit with three of the students one of them would be a therapist, one would be a client, another would be an observer, and I would be supervising and helping the therapist do the session with the client. And this one woman, the client, had what looked like an internal critic, which we all have. Or <laughs> I haven't yet met anyone who doesn't have one. I don't want to claim everybody does. But, you know, that voice in there that's going, you should, uh, and, you know, work harder, all that stuff. But this inner, all the parts in if they're parts of us, have a good intention. It's trying to do something good. And this inner critic in this woman just seemed to be just mean. Nothing good. 
And I'd sort of heard about these unattached burden things. And I said to the man who was acting as your therapist, I said, I don't think you've had any training in this. Would it be all right if I took over the session? And he said, please. (laughs) He was not doing well. And this inner critic in her just kept attacking her. And what's what's good about telling her this? And then it it would just say things like, you know, oh, I want her to feel bad, stuff like that. And this inner critic appeared in her inner world as a bloodshot eyeball that was staring at her, and she would hear this horrible, critical voice. And so when, when we couldn't find any positive intention to this part, because every real part of a person, if you're patient enough, has a positive intention, even suicidal parts, we just asked it, are you a part of her? I didn't want to answer that question. Just patiently and calmly, you know, ask it again. Are you a part of me? And it it said something like, you wish. You know, it had all these prevarications. And then eventually it said to me through her, you're supposed to be a teacher. That's a really stupid question. Don't you have anything smarter to ask? And I laughed and I said, well, it might be stupid, but it's simple. Are you a part of her? And after about five minutes of this, it said, no, I'm not a part of her. I'm a much more glorious being, and I'm going to squash her like a worm the same way I'm going to destroy you. That's an unattached burden. (laughs) It's not part of her system. It didn't come from her own lifetime, her own personal experience. And one of the rules about these things is they only have power in you when they can scare you. And they're really good at scaring people (laughs) because their power depends on it. But when you really can be with all of the parts of you who are scared of them, love those parts, help them be safe, they lose all power. So I didn't know much. I just knew that. I wasn't scared for some reason. I think spirit was with me. (laughs) And we were able to move this thing out into the light and got it out of her system. And then after this session, I had a very bizarre reaction. My core body temperature dropped like three, four degrees, and I was shaking, and I couldn't get warm for hours. And the other trainers were making fun of me. They were saying, oh, you're the ghostbuster. (laughs) I got really angry, and it was not that good. Anyway, I just thought after this, this is just some weird fluke. I'm going to pretend this didn't happen, and, you know, I've got my neat trauma-oriented psychotherapy basis here that I've spent decades developing, and I'm just going to stay with that and ignore this. And then on the way home from that training, this woman starts sending me these long emails about how the light in the airport is more beautiful than she's seen. And I start thinking, oh no, I've triggered a manic episode. And then this thing about, I can, see the, I can see the spark of God in others, even strangers. And I'm going, oh no, oh no, trouble, trouble, trouble. And then she wrote me something that changed my life. She said, Bob, I didn't tell you this in the training, but when I was a young woman, I tried to kill myself many times. And many times I was locked up against my will. And when I, you, when I tried to tell people back then about the non-human inside of me, They gave me electroshock, and they injected me with drugs I didn't want. You're the first human being to ever believe me. Thank you. You've changed my life. And then I went, "Uh, I can't ignore this, you know. And that started more than a decade of study. It's a very profound experience, and you became something of a specialist in dealing with what uh, were called unattached burdens. Mm-hmm. Because other therapists didn't want to touch it. <laughs> they were like me when I started. This is weird. Get me out of here. So they'd, they'd send them to me, which is, you know, which is good in terms of learning. Well, let's step back and talk a little bit more about internal family systems, because even the word burden itself has has a particular meaning in that framework. And there's one part, a really important part I need to talk about. That's the idea of self with a capital S. So we're made up of all these parts. 
And there are no bad parts. All parts are welcome, including suicidal parts, including the parts in an alcoholic that want to drink, all of them. They're all trying to do something good. Suicidal part very often. Well, I'm the last line of defense. If they're in overwhelming pain, I can always take them out. And then we, as the therapist and the person, instead of being terrified of our own suicidal parts, can go, oh, that's a terrible job. <laughs> you know, if, if, if we told you we can get her out of that pain without you having to kill the body, would you be interested? And they almost always answer, yeah, I'd love that, but you can't do it. And what our typical answer would be, would you be willing as an experiment just to give us a chance to prove that we can? And now, all of a sudden, instead of being enemies of that suicidal part, we're partners and assistants, and it's respectful, and that makes it really strong. So there are all these parts. There's also this thing called self, which Dick also discovered by, through his clients. There's something in there, and people would say, oh, that's not a part like the others. That's who I really am. And self is characterized by Dick likes alliteration, eight C's. Compassion, curiosity, creativity, connectedness, clarity, courage. There's a couple more. And it's who we really are. It's also always the witness. It's the eyes we look out at the world through. And Dick realized that what the locus of healing, where healing really happens, is when we can get the parts, very often damaged or reactive or protective, in relationship with this self-energy. Then that's where healing happens. It happens within the client, not between the client and the therapist so much. And the other thing is, he said, which was so meaningful to me, and other people with major trauma histories like mine, self can never be damaged. It cannot be dirtied. It's, it's like the worst storm. Mudslides, winds blow down your house, trees over, power out, everything gone. But when the clouds part, the sun is there. It's undamaged. It's not even dirty. And that sun is who we really are. And he said, Bob, who you really are could not be damaged, even by all the rapes and beatings. That's an incredible message for abuse survivors, because many therapists basically tell them, you're damaged goods, expect a small, miserable life, expect to take meds for the rest of your life. So that, that's super important for people who've endured big abuse. Speaking of uh, abuse, let's talk uh, for a bit about what used to be called multiple personality disorder, which is, I guess you could think of it as sort of an amplification of this idea of many parts. Yep. Yep. I think the basic part structure, the modularity of mind is healthy and good. In multiple personality disorder, those boundaries between the parts become extremely rigid and the access to self becomes limited. Um, I think many, those very early people, Cluft and Braun and Putnam, there were a bunch of doctors who really sort of discovered and opened up this field. They also found something like self. They found this transcendent, I don't even know what to call it, <laughs> so, seat of consciousness that could not be damaged. And they, they called it the internal self-helper, the ish. And Ralph Allison was the first to write about it. And he said, well, I see even in the most extremely damaged clients, I seem to be meeting this thing that's wise. It knows all the other altars and it has great advice. Are you, uh, and I listen to it because it's useful. Are, are the rest of you meeting this? And they all went, yeah, and we don't know what it is, <laughs> but it seems to be there. I think of it as the divine spark within each of us. And I think Carl Jung talked about the archetype of the self as, as being ultimately the Godhead archetype. Yes. And he talked about developing the self-ego axis. 
especially like, I think it was Edinger in Los Angeles. This is, and that's exactly what IFS is saying in a different language. It's the relationship between self and the parts. That's where healing is. I think Jung says it's the, re, the self ego access that, that uh, facilitates individuation, I think would be the Jungian language. So, when in your work, as, as you're dealing with these unattached burdens, well, before we go too far, let's, let's talk about the, what the word burden refers to in IFS. Great. Thank you. I was really looking forward to your questions because I knew they'd be helpful. Um, the parts are all good. They're all welcome. But they very often carry burdens. And we all get them, even if you have a loving childhood. There's a quote I love, you can't become adult without becoming adulterated. <laughs> there are parts of us that get sort of exiled. You know, like the, the raging two-year-old who's going, no, no, no. <laughs> that gets sort of shut off and put away. The two-year-old isn't bad. Not at all. It's delightful and full of connection to the divine. But it has a burden. It carries this burden of anger and blame and rage. Other parts carry burdens of shame or all sorts of different burdens. A lot of times it's memories. People with trauma, this is how people can dissociate from trauma so they could survive. They sort of wall it off and it forms this little cyst deep down inside them and so they can go on and survive. And so these parts aren't bad that have all this stuff. They just carry these heavy burdens. And in IFS, what we do is we go and witness those parts until they feel completely seen. This is not catharsis. It's quite different. Which we could spend a whole thing, <laughs> a, whole, a whole hour just on that difference. But then until they feel completely witnessed, and then we retrieve them, we get them out of there, and then we help them get these burdens off of them and out of them. And that's actually an almost shamanic uh, process. You say almost shamanic, but I know that you reference the shamanic traditions as being, I think, in a way, you, you would suggest that your work is a continuation of that tradition. I would, and I sort of, I'm trying to be mild about what I believe because I don't want to get Dick too angry at me. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely believe it's full on shamanic. And the way, the way we do it is we just, we say, you know, can you, are you ready to let go of all this? When it is, we say, well, how, we don't want to just let that out there. Would you, how about putting it in one of the elements? You want to put it, bury it in earth, have water wash it away, have fire burn it up, have the air blow it away, have light take it. So that's a very shamanic invitation, I believe. And you're working it with mental imagery the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been talking to some Jungians lately, which I love because my first love when I was getting into psychology was Jung. And they're saying, well, you're really doing act Jungian active imagination. And I say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> no, no argument. Yep. I think, you know, with um, Henri Corbin, that there's this, what he called the imaginal realm. And it, I, believe, I actually have come to believe it's more real than the external physical world. And I believe that our, what we call imagination is actually a perceptual system, like sight or hearing, because we're too crude <laughs> to perceive these energies directly. We have to clothe them in images so that we can navigate that realm. So I think these images have a reality that is perhaps greater than our daily reality, not, not less. It seems to me that the whole profession of psychotherapy, going back to Freud and Jung certainly, has always been a, a struggle between trying to prove to the world that you're scientists on the one hand and hide the fact that actually what you're doing is very shamanic and imbued with mysticism. And it's always seemed like a, a little bit schizoid. 
Jung himself. But uh, to to give credit to the scientific side, I know you draw upon recent research in epigenetics, which suggests that learned behaviors from our ancestors gets passed on to us in these uh, epigenetic features of of our genes themselves that it's sort of uh, Lamarckian genetics revised uh, uh, again and it's it used to be very controversial when i was young i was taught that Lamarckian genetics has been disproven but the field of epigenetics suggests otherwise you relate the burdens that people receive from their ancestors, even, to the field of epigenetics. This is exactly what I wanted to talk about. I'm so glad you brought this up. Because we go inside, in this inner world, we start to learn to navigate in this imaginal realm. And the deeper we get, the weirder the creatures are we meet. You know, we're going to the antipodes of the mind, and there's stuff in there that's not from our own personal history. It's not from our lifetimes. And usually people uh, just, you know, want me to go away when I start talking about this. It's too weird. But epigenetics, because it's a hard science now, it sort of cracks open the door so that even the most rigid rationalist materialist has to go, oh, there's something here. And yeah, what I was taught that Lamarckian uh, uh, stuff was absolute garbage. When I was in college, the biology teacher sneered at that and made jokes about it. And now it turns out it's right. And I think there's one experiment which is, makes it absolutely clear. And it was done with rats. And that seems to be the new, real, the new standard of reality. If you can do it with rats, it's real. <laughs> if it only happens to humans, it doesn't count. So, uh, Diaz and Ressler, and that's with an R, not with a W. Uh, Diaz is from Emory, Ressler's from Harvard. Diaz came up in a very poor Hispanic communities in Atlanta, Georgia. And he recognized that mental illness and addictions tended to run in families. And he thought, well, this could be behavioral transmission, but maybe there's something more. So he designed what I think is an a, a immensely clever experiment to investigate this. He took a male rat, just the male, and exposed it to a relatively pleasant scent, somewhat like cherries or almonds, you know, sort of. And he paired that with electrical shocks until the male rat got a startle response to the smell, classical conditioning. Then he took sperm from the male rat, impregnated a female rat, who'd never met the male rat and never smelled this chemical. And then when, when her pups were born, when they were of a certain age, he tested them. A lot of those pups had the startle response. To the same odor. And the pups of the pups had the startle response. So there is something going on here that's way beyond what traditional genetics can, can explain. and. Also, another body of work that makes this overwhelmingly clear is Rachel Yehuda at the Icon School of Medicine. She's published, I think it's over 500 peer-reviewed articles on the Holocaust survivors' children and grandchildren. It's clear there's something that gets passed down. Um, and there are many other studies of epigenetics now. So it's hard science. And so people can sort of open up to this idea, maybe there's some burden in me from my ancestors, even ancestors I don't know anything about. And then once you get the door open, just that crack, well, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of other stuff in here too we'd rather not look at. And it's certainly the case if we look at human history that all of us must have ancestors who experienced horrible, horrible events. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I think some of this stuff is not legacy burdens. It's something else, but I don't know. <laughs> and I just go with whatever the client wants to think. If they want to look 
consider this as a legacy burden, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. And since you've got epigenetics as a materialistic foundation for explaining legacy burdens, it's become safer. When you get into the parapsychological realm, which is really my domain, <laughs> you're pushing the paradigm further <clears throat> beyond the possibility, it seems, of a materialistic explanation, at least so far. And, and I would venture to say probably forever, there will not be a materialistic explanation for the things that parapsychologists encounter because they clearly point to a paradigm in which consciousness, uh, in, meaning mind at large, not our individual consciousness, is, is primary. I agree. I agree. And that's one reason why I love the work of Bernardo Kastrup and Donald Hoffman and all these other we live in an era with so many exciting thinkers. I want to say one other, because a lot of what I've done in that most recent book is tried to make this stuff at least vaguely palatable to, <laughs> to academics. And one other way I've put this is there's a basic biopsychological dynamic that occurs in almost every culture we have record of. It's one of the, the most widely distributed cultural phenomena. And in every era of history we have records of, this dynamic can have immense impact on individuals for good or for bad. And the metaphor used to describe this dynamic is usually spirit possession. The metaphor doesn't matter to me so much, but this is worthy of serious study. And I can assure you that even members of the parapsychology community have been hesitant to get into this area, but it is becoming a subject of discussion for, for a variety of reasons, one of which is the fact that there are very serious conventional psychotherapists who talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and... I, I do get a lot, a lot of resistance. And, you know, Dick, for many years, did not want me to publish that book and did, you know, did a lot to discourage me. At the same time, he co-authored a book with you, which really laid the foundation for all of this work. Yeah. And that one was an attempt to take his internal family systems uh, therapy model and put it in the big framework it deserves. Because it, it's this idea of parts and this idea of self, they show up all over the world in all eras of history. And he, he you know, he's so busy in his psychotherapy world, he, he, he doesn't have the, the research time. And I'm, I love books. I could sit down all day and study and be very happy. So, Well, I have to say, though, for purposes of clarification, that the very fact that he co-authored this book with you and that I see in your newest book a, a dozen other leading therapists, medical doctors and licensed clinical psychologists all speak extremely highly of the, the benefit that they have gained from working with you and understanding your approach to this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get this odd phenomena, you know, for, I'm going to back up a little bit. When I started my work, childhood sexual abuse was not recognized by the therapeutic establishment. They just sort of went, this doesn't happen. And that's not that long ago, late 60s, early 70s. And much of my career back then was just being sort of an advocate and being one of the first men to say, this doesn't just happen to women, you know, and being sort of an activist around childhood sexual abuse issues. And back then, I would get this phenomena of people would ignore me in the lecture or the talk, and then they'd come up to me in the hallway and whisper to me, me too. And I, I sort of getting that same feeling again, <laughs> this stuff about unattached burdens. They sort of have to feel they have to have their academic dignity, and then they come up and say, yeah, me too, I've seen that. Well, what impressed me in your recent book is that there is a lengthy, 
process. It has seven or eight different steps involved and, and you specify each of them. And I gather that in a therapeutic process, you might spend quite a bit of time on each of those steps. But at the end of the day, you're pretty successful at relieving people of these, uh, we could call them possessions. Yeah. And I do fail. I don't want to pretend I'm perfect. And another thing I want to say, th this is uh, pioneering work pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable or bullet. I know I'm wrong about a lot of stuff. <laughs> I know I've got to be, I hope I'm usefully wrong. I hope somebody can see how I was wrong and go one better. Another thing I deeply believe in is a teacher, no matter how popular they are or how successful is only really a good teacher if their students can go farther than they did. So my sort of goal in doing what I'm doing is to stimulate people to go farther than I've been able to go and to find the errors I've made. And, you know, it's, it's just a beginning. Our Western world has been willfully blind to all this stuff for centuries. We're just cracking open doors. I think it's way too soon for any, anybody to think they have final answers. And I definitely don't. Everything is, is like a suggestion or an opening, something more like that. Well, I think one of the most important principles that you've enunciated is, is that in the case of some external entity impinging on, on an individual psyche in a negative way, and they're not all negative, many of them are positive, but in, in a negative way, it's often because one of the parts of, of this internal family is attached to it. One part seems to feel that it's useful for their particular purposes. And if you want to depossess that individual, you really got to work and get the whole family of parts in agreement about it. Yeah. And the, the most common thing I've seen, some little kid is feeling absolutely powerless, especially if they're being abused. And some external energy comes to them saying, oh, I can give you power. I'm this great big hoopa hoopa, you know. <laughs> and the kid goes, sure, come on in. I need power. But these things, are they don't really give power. They're parasites. They drain life energy. And they keep these parts weak and dependent. So the parts don't want to let them go. So the way we help people release these things is to help them develop a self-part relationship with that part. And if we're just patient, it's going to work because a self-part relationship at the end of the day will always leave that part feeling stronger. And this parasitic relationship with an external energy will always at the end of the day leave the part feeling weaker. So if we're just patient and stay with this, there's no need for the violence of exorcisms and deliverance stuff and, you know, this tearing parts out. It's a very slow, uh, you know, offering love and compassion to the part, and then they'll release this. And that there's, so it's a very uh, sort of gentle process. It's not all this violence. And I've come to think with, I think the spiritists of Brazil know a tremendous amount about this stuff. But they say that it, when their mediums are working, that the spirit who's in the person also becomes their client. And that those spirits are not fundamentally evil. They're lost, suffering, desperate, confused, and they need our help too. So it, it, I don't go in there with this exorcist idea of I'm going to beat up some nasty spirit, you know, at all. Another one of your key insights is that after the unattached burden, I'll use that language, has been removed, the whole system needs healing because it had established a, a certain equilibrium with that possession, with that obsession, or whatever you'd like to call it. And now that that 
piece of the uh, whole system has been removed, the, the entire system needs help realigning itself. Definitely. The metaphor I like uh, is imagine you're in a canoe and a very heavy person gets out of the canoe. You can expect to be bobbling around here. It's going to feel different and weird and a little unsteady. There's one thing you mentioned before I really want to come back to. Um, these are not all negative experiences at all. One reason why, there are a couple of reasons why it predominates in my work. One is because I worked in a therapeutic environment. So people came to me who were suffering. And so that's just, it's just, you know, a sampling bias. Um, the other thing I want, if you look at the history of possession worldwide in the history of religions and in anthropology, which my, my first training was in anthropology, the vast majority of possessions are sought after. They're really desired. It's spirit contact, spirit presence experiences, to use Tanya Lerman's uh, phrase. And, you know, you can think of all these spiritual disciplines as, as ways to elicit this kind of contact. So another, another aspect of if you've gotten one of these negative energies out, another thing you can do to rebalance the system is help people invite in positive energies. And that's another, uh, and and that of course, uh, that will get you. That will get your license removed. <laughs> okay. Well, in in fact, it has happened. Licenses have been removed from therapists who engage in this work, and uh, it, it seems to me I've also read that. There have been occasions in which internal family systems therapists have been sued by their former patients. I'm not. I'm not so sure about that. There might have been, but I'm. Not, uh, I don't think around this particular. Dick is very afraid of lawsuits, but I just. I want to say, if something in my book appears weird and flaky, it's me. <laughs> don't blame Dick. The lawsuits that I read about briefly by doing. Uh, a, a search using AI was that, that clients complained that under hypnosis, they were instructed to remember traumatic events, uh, traumatic events of abuse. And the question is, did those events really exist or were they induced in the uh, hypnotic process? Okay. That would be the false memory people back at it. I thought, yeah. I thought like uh, Dracula, they were dead. 50 years ago, but they, they have come back or they have not never stopped. Remembering traumatic events uh, is a, a part of, of this work. Yeah, very often. Oh, okay, let's talk about that. Every form of trauma is associated with memory disturbance. The very first book I, I actually co-edited way before Dick was called Trauma Memory Trauma, amnesia, and the denial of abuse. Every form of trauma has interruptions and disruptions of memory associated with it. The, for instance, I had a friend who was in a car wreck, and his ribs were broken, and he was in the car and with his partner, and they were driving to the hospital, and his partner said, you know, we had a conversation all the way to the hospital. And the guy remembered none of it. Complete amnesia for, you know... 40 minutes or so. The type of trauma that's remembered best is single event adult trauma. The type that's remembered worst is multiple event childhood trauma. And I know that's very sort of counterintuitive, but when there are multiple, uh, same, similar trauma occurs many, many times, a person's system develops ways to deal with it. It learns a way to encapsulate this and put it away. And for children who are being abused, they do not have the resources to tolerate the emotions that, 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 that those, those events produce. So they have to find a way to encapsulate them, hide them away, and d deal with them later. So the the... Most people who are abused as children have some degree of amnesia for what happened to them. 
And then later, when they're in a secure situation and have more psychological resources, those memories start returning. We could do a whole other segment on, on, on the false memory issue. But I, I, I'm pretty sure when it comes to, for example, multiple personality disorder, now known as dissociative identity disorder, trauma is, is almost always at the basis of it. Definitely. Yeah. And that unfortunately skewed the whole Western attitude toward parts because we thought the parts themselves came from trauma, which I think is a, is a big error. In fact, I think in the position of the IFS therapist is that these parts are healthy healing responses to the trauma. Well, they're there all along. Um, we come, we come into the world pre-wired with parts. And it's good and we need them. If you look at a computer, a, an AI design, you know, trying to, if they just try and have one central processing unit doing the whole job, it's the computer is an idiot. <laughs> what they need is all these relatively encapsulated subroutines that are sparsely interlinked. That's the way our minds work too. And that's sort of computer science talk for parts. <laughs> we have all these things that are relatively encapsulated that are sparsely interlinked because that kind of cognitive architecture is much more powerful than one big mush. I see. So when I get a, a new Apple computer and it has four cores or eight cores or 16 cores in its processor, that, that's the reference. I'm not, sh I, I don't know enough to <laughs> answer that, yeah. but I know it has to be subroutines. And, yeah. you know, there's a whole branch of mathematics called nonlinear dynamics that shows how many, many systems of a certain complexity have to be organized this way. Well, it makes sense when you consider nature itself, like uh, like the weather. There are always more variables involved in any natural system than, than we can accommodate in a laboratory experiment. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think nature itself is, a, is the best argument for porosity of mind. I mean, if you look at any living system, it's porous. It's... Every cell is surrounded by a semi-permeable membrane. <laughs> it has to be, or it's dead. Why would we think our minds are any different? I mean, it's just sort of nuts. When you start thinking about it, it's like, how could we believe that? Mm -hmm. But we do. And it's built into our language. It's built in so deeply to the way we are in the world. It's really hard to think outside that box. You know, this guy, what's his name? Daniel Siegel, the interpersonal neurobiology guy. He says, we can't, we have to invent a whole new language because it's built, it's so profoundly built into our language that we can't even think this way in terms of porosity of mind and systemic interreactions and that mind is a field and we're just nodes in the field. And I believe he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And it makes it makes all psi phenomena to be an of course. Not only that, it would suggest that as spiritual beings ourselves, we're never without psi phenomena. It's always impinging on us in one way or another. Yeah, and 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 we're trained to ignore it. It's beaten out of us. There's a there's a wonderful image from Swedenborg that I just love, and I'm. I'm going to have a book out on Swedenborg and IFS in, a, in the early next year, hopefully. Swedenborg was talking about how we tend to think that spiritual experience is something we have to go to the other side of the planet. It's some bird of paradise we can only hope to catch a glimpse of in some jungle on the other side of the planet. He says, no, 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 that's wrong. That's wrong. Spirit is right here, right now. And she so wants your attention, that she is brushing your eyelids with her wingtips. That's a beautiful metaphor. Let's talk for a moment about discarnate humans. When we talk about spirit possession in the parapsychology literature, the clearest cases are ones in, in which a, a person 
is sick and uh, maybe on the verge of death, maybe even pronounced dead. There's one case the family is getting ready for cremation in India when all of a sudden the body sits up and it's a different person with a different history and a different name and speaks a different language and remains in the body, says, well, I've uh, come back. I was murdered in a village in a hundred kilometers away, but I've been given a reprieve and I'll be in this body now for another dozen years. And, and then that happens and it's validated over and over again, particularly the linguistic issues. How does I know this is going to confront the boggle thresholds of almost everybody with conventional psychological training, but these cases exist. Yes, yes. And I, I just gave a class about this, and Dr. Ian Stevenson and Dr. Jim Tucker provide absolutely overwhelming evidence. I mean, he studied reincarnation experiences in children. They both did in children. And he collected over 2,500. And he would actually, he would send people to India or Burma or wherever they had these experiences. And he would investigate the kids. And then he'd go to the village they said they lived in before. And he would find the previous family. And he had over 1,500 cases where they could, he called them proved where the kids' discussions of the previous family were real. And, it, and way back in 1977, the head reviewer for the journal of um, the JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the most uptight and rigid materialist journals on the planet, this head reviewer reviewed Stevenson's work and said, Dr. Stevenson has presented a very carefully researched and completely unemotional body of data that cannot be ignored. Of course, it has been ignored. <laughs> it doesn't seem to matter how much data there is. The, uh, the people's ability to go like this is astounding. Well, you're referring to cases that are thought of as reincarnation. Possession is sort of a step further. You could think of it as replacement reincarnation, where the, the new incarnation occurs in not in an infant, but in, in the body of, could even be an adult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think of it as a very similar phenomena along a similar spectrum. You know, there's this phenomena that was reported in Tibet, and I don't, this French guy whose name I'm, uh, is escaping me reported it. He said there was this Lama who wanted to be reincarnated instantly because there was some important work to do. So they had his body on this platform, and they, they covered it, and they had like a five-year-old or four-year-old boy under the cover with the llama, and they did this ritual and the music and the chanting. And then there was this big, like, something happened under that cover, and they took it out, and the llama's spirit was in the boy. And the boy correctly identified, you know, the, the, the rosary beads and the other objects of the Lama, and he was installed as the Lama right away. Mm. So that's sort of like the case you're mentioning, isn't it? Yes, there's a, a similarity. And I think what it, it minimally what I gather that you're suggesting is we have to pay attention to these cases and I, it's very tempting to adopt the spiritist model, but I think what I hear you saying is you're trying to refrain from drawing any firm metaphysical conclusions. Definitely, definitely. I'm back to William James again. <laughs> he talked a lot about radical pragmatism, and he even went so far as to say, whatever works is real. I don't know what's real, Jeffrey. <laughs> I'm just another bozo on the bus. But I can tell what helps people. People come to me, they're very often suffering, and if I keep my blinders on and focus, what can help me relieve the suffering of this human being sitting in front of me today, that's something I can hope to learn in one lifetime. Or at least, <laughs> at least move, at least get better at that. You know, I've, I've had to cut down my, my goals. Of course, I'm fascinated by all that other stuff. Absolutely fascinated. And it's a, 
big act of self-discipline for me not to use my clients as research subjects. And I, I consider that a very important ethical thing that because I get so excited about this stuff, as may be obvious, just me talking with you. Well, it is an area that deserves to be researched, and, and I hope that happens. And I also hope, Robert, that we can have you back many more times because I know we're just scratching the surface of your vast experience in, in this domain. But nevertheless, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking this time to be with me and to be with the New Thinking Aloud audience. It's delightful to be with you, Jeff, and I'll be back as many times as you want until you're bored with me. <laughs> that That's great, because I, I, I feel so strongly that your work is on the cutting edge of an area where I get regular appeals for help from people. So I'm, I'm so glad that I can minimally refer them to your books. Great. Thank you so much. Delightful to be with you. Thank you, Robert. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you, because you are the reason that we are here. Book two in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series is a tribute to parapsychologist Russell Targ celebrating his 90th birthday. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.